Hey, everybody. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here today. My name is Alexandria Beck, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about global movement building, specifically how the Open Wing Alliance is spreading ideas and driving progress worldwide. So I want to start off by quickly introducing myself. Uh, I'm the director of the Open Wing Alliance at the Humane League, and I live in Denver, Colorado, with my partner and our two cats. And this is my first time visiting London, so I'm really excited to be here. I first got involved in animal activism several years ago when I started the first student animal rights group at my university and launched our initial campaign to get all of the dining halls at our university to go cage free. And today, I'm responsible for coordinating organizations around the world to take effective action for animals. So I also want to quickly give a shout out to my colleague, Amy O'Dean. Um, she's our global corporate relations coordinator. And she's not here today, but she did create several of the beautiful slides that I'm about to show. And she also um, shared a lot of the information that I'll cover today during the recent CARE conference um, at, in Warsaw. So, um, <clears throat> If you're interested in checking out a recording of her talk, she spoke for about 40 minutes on the global cage-free movement, and you can find that on YouTube by searching for Conference on Animal Rights in Europe. I don't know if I'm supposed to do something different, but the slides aren't changing at the bottom <laughs> of the screen. <laughs> um, oh, I guess, it, oh, now it's working. He fixed it, thank you. So for those of you who aren't as familiar with the Open Wing Alliance, we're a global coalition of 70 organizations around the world working to end the abuse of chickens worldwide. And together, our coalition is changing the way that the world's biggest companies treat animals. And we're setting a new standard for corporate animal welfare policies locally, in every major market, and globally. So our first step toward achieving our goal is eliminating battery cages from the planet. We chose to focus on helping egg-laying hens because billions of hens are confined around the world in cruel cages like these that don't allow them to express any of their natural behaviors. In fact, right now, there are over five billion hens laying over one trillion eggs every single year. And while these figures are incomprehensible, at least for me. Luckily, we are starting to make progress on this issue. So thanks to organizations working in the US and Canada, cage-free is becoming the norm. So food companies across all major sectors have committed to go 100% cage-free with over 500 commitments secured across North America. And the Humane League Labs recently published a comprehensive report on US egg production data that shows the percentage of hens living in cage-free housing systems. So it's currently over just 20%, which as you can see from five or 10 years ago, this is a huge step in the right direction. And it's safe to say that these corporate commitments have a direct impact on this increase alongside other important activism strategies like supporting legislation. And similarly, across Europe, home to some of the largest egg producers in the world, animal protection groups have worked to secure over 750 cage-free policies, and this number is constantly increasing. And the European Commission currently reports that over 50% of hens across Europe now reside in cage-free systems. And it's also safe to say that this increase is directly correlated with these corporate commitments. But because the abuse of animals raised for food is a global crisis, the kind of progress that we're seeing in North America and in Europe needs to be seen across the globe, especially when you consider that even if all of the companies across Europe, Africa, North America, Latin America, and Oceania committed to being 100% cage-free, we still wouldn't even be halfway toward eradicating cages for hens because currently Asia produces over 60%
of the global egg supply. So with this stark realization in mind, we founded the Open Wing Alliance in 2016 to bring groups together to disrupt animal agriculture by leveraging the competitive advantage of each organization in the coalition and filling any skill gaps through training and shared resources. So we believe that building a global network to rally behind this issue is the best way to drive progress. And currently, oh, sorry, the first and most fundamental aspect of the framework that we utilize to drive progress, I think, can be utilized to create positive social change in other cause areas as well. And that is the decentralized coalition model that we utilize. So rather than creating branches of the Humane League all over the world, we team up with existing local organizations who already have the organizational infrastructure, the volunteer base, cultural knowledge, and establishment. So by bringing groups together with a clear shared goal, we can achieve our same goals except much faster and much more efficiently. And today, the global network of the Open Wing Alliance stands at 70 organizations in 57 countries. So another important aspect of this coalition model is distributed leadership and decision making. So we do have our basic coalition member responsibilities and rules, and we have our agreed upon basic strategy and our shared goal. But other than that, you know, coalition members really have the autonomy and the freedom to self-organize, be creative, and utilize their preferred campaign tactics. And the OWA is certainly not the first or the only coalition to utilize this type of model. So I want to briefly touch on a few other ways that OWA functions to support its members and its mission. So first, we provide and crowdsource free resources and trainings to our member groups. So we have an online resource library with dozens of corporate campaign-related resources. We also host several events, such as a global summit and several smaller regional summits throughout the year to provide a space for coalition members to strategize together around our shared goal. And these events also serve as a training for newer groups. So this photo was actually taken just a few months ago at our third annual global summit in Warsaw, where we had about 140 activists coming from 44 organizations in 46 countries. Newer coalition groups are also able to request personalized training from a more established group to help them come up with a strategy that's suitable for the cultural and political context in which they're working. And in addition to training and resources, we also give grants to some of our member groups to fund their corporate campaign work. So as you can see, our grant program has grown significantly in the past three years. And if you're interested, you can see a breakdown of our grant recipients by country and by organization on our website, openwingalliance.org. So now that I've explained the basics of how our coalition is structured, I want to get into the actual work that we do in terms of securing these animal welfare policies, some of the unique challenges that we've encountered, our approach to overcoming them, and some of the results that we've seen so far. So to date, groups have worked to secure over 65 policies where companies have committed to go cage-free across their entire global portfolio. And these are just some of the biggest companies to release global policies, with the most recent being Wyndham and Best Western. And the Best Western victory alone impacted over 5 million egg-laying hens. So these global policies are a great way to have a huge impact on a large number of animals. <clears throat> and while most of these commitments were secured through dialogue and negotiations with company leadership, in some cases, massive global campaign efforts from OWA groups have been required to encourage some companies to commit, such as Hilton earlier this year, where this relentless group of activists came together to show Hilton just what we thought of their cruel cages. 
and Hilton ended up releasing their global cage-free policy just 24 hours after the OWA campaign launch. So the next step, of course, after getting these global policies is holding the companies accountable and making sure that they actually follow through with these commitments. And one way that we can do that is ensuring that the companies commit to translate their policy into the major regional languages. So in addition to public accountability, this is a great way to drive progress in areas where it's more difficult to get corporate commitments or in areas that are less conducive to social change, like China, where we recently saw the first six companies with global policies have them translated in Chinese. So in addition to these massive coalition-wide global campaigns, groups are also able to self-organize regional campaigns. So one recent example of this is groups teaming up to pressure Subway to extend their cage-free policy to Asia with a 2025 deadline, just as they had done in the Americas and in Europe. So some groups participated by having negotiations and dialogue with the local Subway leadership, and other groups participated by launching pressure campaigns against Subway, like Synergia Animal, who led a joint pressure campaign in Thailand with support from the SPCA in Malaysia. And because these groups are part of the OWA, they can easily get support from the rest of the coalition members to pressure Subway. And earlier this month, these groups celebrated as the sandwich giant did end up extending their cage-free policy with a 2025 deadline to seven countries in Asia. So speaking of Asia, now I wanna get into some of the region-specific case studies and review the unique challenges that groups are working to overcome in this region. So in terms of securing corporate animal welfare policies, these seem to be the main barriers that groups are facing. First, over 90% of hens throughout Asia are in cages. So it's an extremely pervasive problem. Additionally, there's very little existing momentum in the region with consumers seeming to be less sympathetic to farm animal causes. Several large corporations are also headquartered here. So extremely influential companies in quite difficult areas to infiltrate. And finally, environments being less conducive to social change. However, groups are doing amazing work here. And there are two tactics being taken to overcome these barriers and to drive progress to these higher welfare regions. So the first is utilizing those global commitments that I just spoke about to trigger movement in certain areas, especially if the global policies are translated into the regional languages, just like those Chinese policies. And second, the corporate relations and campaign work of groups in Asia are driving regional commitments on the ground. So these groups are working tirelessly to secure cage-free policies from local businesses, largely through a more cooperative approach. Many countries within Asia are practically impossible to campaign within, so the groups are overcoming these challenges by being creative and nimble and working with companies to influence change on the ground. So one example of a creative initiative happening in Asia is the Cage-Free Producers Alliance that an OWA organization called EAST started in Taiwan. So because a lack of supply is a real problem for many companies in Asia, EAST created this alliance to essentially bridge the gap between companies and suppliers and to assist them in their cage-free transition. So this seems to be working pretty well. Uh, several producers have already signed on to participate in this alliance, and the leadership at EAST think that it's poten there's potential to spread this idea and create similar alliances in other countries where it makes sense. So because they're a part of this coalition, we can easily get resources from them and share those resources with other groups so that they can utilize a similar tactic and hopefully achieve similar results. 
So because of innovative efforts like this that act as solutions to regional barriers, we are starting to see some progress. Like Carrefour, the largest retailer in Asia, releasing their cage-free policy for Taiwan after working together with East and the Humane League. So with momentum starting to build in the region, we've also made connections with many promising organizations in Asia, and we're really excited to get more familiar with them and their work at our upcoming inaugural regional summit in Asia, in Taiwan, taking place next month. So at this summit, these groups will be able to come together, further discuss these barriers, and brainstorm solutions to overcoming them together. So next, I want to briefly talk about Latin America and some of the challenges that groups seem to be encountering there. One challenge is the region having very little regulation and no jurisdiction security. So for example, recently in Brazil, the Ministry of Agriculture decided to completely neglect what the term cage-free even means. And for nearly 40 days, producers couldn't sell their cage-free eggs. Also, agricultural industries have a very large and heavy influence on politics due to social inequality and a challenging distribution of lands. Um, producers who can offer cage-free eggs can typically only offer them in a certain part of the country, and it's really difficult to get a commitment that will extend to the entire country. And consumers seem to have generally a low understanding of farm animal welfare and are disconnected to where their food comes from. So as we can see, it's a very challenging environment to be doing this type of work. And it's also quite different from the environment in Asia. So to help drive progress in this region, we have started to give grants to some organizations working in South America and one of those groups, called ARBA, is using some of their funds to run awareness-raising campaigns in Peru to tackle one of the main barriers that they're facing. So they released a new website with several videos illustrating the difference between cage and cage-free production. This website outlines the problem, how 98% of hens in Peru are in cages. It gives consumers the chance to get involved in their campaign, and it also lists all the companies in Peru who already have cage-free policies. So this strategy of raising awareness in tandem with corporate outreach and campaigns seems to be working really well for ARBA. They've already secured over 22 policies in Peru with just two staff and a very limited budget. So at events like our upcoming Latin America Summit taking place next week, they'll have the opportunity to share their tactics and their lessons learned with the rest of the groups who can hopefully use similar tactics in their areas and achieve similar results. Of course, with this work being relatively new, in most South American countries, we haven't figured out solutions to every challenge. So our regional coordinator in Latin America recently launched a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship program to provide a space for individuals working within the OWA to share some of the challenges that they're facing, brainstorm solutions together. And we're hoping that this um, program will allow people to come up with new ideas, build bonds and trust between members, and reduce feelings of isolation and burnout that can often come from engaging in difficult work. So one of the people participating in this program recently said that this program is a brilliant tool to motivate and promote the personal growth of activists inside their organizations and in the broader animal rights movement. So with so many historic firsts happening in the region, despite the difficulty of working on this issue, we're really excited to connect with more organizations who are interested in working on corporate campaigns in the future and to help them as they troubleshoot innovative ideas to tackle some of the barriers that they're facing. So to sum up, OWA groups around the world have worked to create an aligned global strategy for 
to drive progress in this highly neglected cause area. And despite the many challenges of working on a global scale alongside the region-specific barriers, groups are making progress in essentially every part of the world. And we attribute that progress to these five things. First, the decentralized coalition that allows for the fostering and spreading of new ideas throughout a larger network. Second, utilizing global momentum to drive progress in challenging areas. Third, supporting regional groups and empowering them to self-organize regional campaigns. Fourth, adapting approaches based on each country-specific context where you're working. And finally, um, just remaining nimble and being ready to pivot strategies as needed. So I hope that some of these ideas can be meaningfully applied to your movement building efforts. And I just want to quickly mention that I gave a similar presentation last year at the International Animal Rights Conference, um, where I share a lot more case studies and go into more detail. So if you want to check that out, you can search on YouTube for my name and the power of coalitions. And that's it for me. Thank you so much for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Focusing just kind of on the coalition structure, because that's really you know, what your uh, talk was about, I was interested in how similar or different the goals for the different groups may be. Like, are some, I assume some are wanting to go well beyond just banning cages, but maybe some are, would, would be content if they could achieve that and don't necessarily want to go further. So how, how different are the goals across all these different groups? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, right now, our main focus, I would say, is banning cages. However, there are some groups in some European countries where they've already gotten cage-free commitments from basically every company in their country, and they've now moved on to work on campaigns that improve the lives of chickens raised for meat, um, or broiler chickens. And OWA has also expanded to support that type of work as well. So if groups aren't working on cage-free with OWA, they're moving on to broiler campaigns. So is that ever a source of tension between groups that, I mean, that there are, I, I imagine there must be divergent goals in terms of what the kind of dream state of the future is for organizations in different places. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in terms of what their own organizational goals are, that's really up for them to decide. Like, if they want to do additional campaigns outside of OWA's work, they're more than welcome to do that. Obviously, we don't really have... Um, any kind of control over what organizations want to do at their own level. Um, but we haven't really seen much tension or disagreement between groups. They're very supportive of one another. Um, and even groups who aren't yet working on these broiler campaigns are still able to support the broiler campaigns of other organizations by putting pressure on these companies from abroad. So we really haven't seen that much tension around the different issues. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, question from the audience around just communication tools, especially because yeah. you're kind of crossing the great firewall to some extent. So what are the organization communication tools that you've found to be effective worldwide? Yeah, so um, Slack, for sure, is like our main way of staying connected and communicating. We host video calls quite regularly through um, Zoom. We use apps like Calendly to schedule meetings across time zones without having that confusion of what time is it for you or for me, it's going to be this time. Um, so, yeah, I think those are probably the main tools that we are currently utilizing. Uh, another question about operating, of course, in different contexts. Uh, you mentioned, you know, obviously some countries more democratic and open to public uh, demonstrations than others. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit more about how that plays out in uh, practice across these different contexts and, and what you found effective, especially in some of the harder to reach places. Yeah, so um, in places like, I guess, Japan, for instance, where we do have a Humane League office, the groups, or our group working there has had a lot of success just really going to meetings with companies, having this dialogue with them and explaining to them how the global cage-free movement is basically going to come to their country 
at some point no matter what. Um, and it's really better for them to just get ahead of the curve and go ahead and adapt these policies now um, instead of scrambling at the last minute to adapt them as the rest of the world is also adapting. So that works well in our favor, um, especially also like I mentioned, getting the companies who operate globally to agree to make these commitments in parts of the world that are more challenging, um, as you said, to run pressure campaigns in. And how about on the follow through or kind of, you know, trust but verify uh, side, let's say, are people actually going to chicken farms in China and like uh, checking in on these campaigns and what change is actually making on the, is happening on the ground? Or I imagine like in Argentina, that could be pretty challenging too. So how does that look in different places in the world? Yeah, good question. So what we've started to do to address this is require that these company commitments include updating on their progress. So there are websites out there like EggTrack um, that tracks the company's progress toward their commitment so that they're publicly reporting and we kind of put that burden on them to tell us how far are you, what percentage of your eggs are now coming from cage-free hens um, versus caged hens. And luckily we are starting to see a lot of companies report on their progress. That's awesome. Well. We are unfortunately out of time for the moment, but you've got office hours immediately following this, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. I okay, do. cool. So you can come see Alexandria in person and ask more questions there. How about another round of applause for Alexandria Beck? Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>